In the course of years, we all have some tendency to get set in our ways. Habits arise not only from the things that happen to us, but from our consistent reaction to these occurrences. Once we have set up a pattern of reactions, we are inclined to stay with that pattern. And through the years, it deepens and becomes more definitely a part of our permanent natures. As a result of the way in which we develop patterns of reaction, life becomes apparently a rather consistent situation, but it is sometimes negatively consistent. As the individual who may say, well, here it is again, I've been in trouble all my life. This attitude, once it is held, will ensure that the trouble continues. Actually, subconsciously, we begin looking for trouble. And anyone who engages in that pursuit will never be disappointed. Uh, this is not exactly a problem of simply trying to hold a constructive mental attitude. It is more than that. It is possible to build some kind of a defense against all of the occurrences of life. We develop a kind of frozen smile with which to face every difficulty. This gains us a certain reputation from other people, but means very little so far as our own consciousness is concerned. We try sometimes to take the position or to take the point of view uh, that we can explain all the conditions that arise by simply regarding them as negative mental phenomena. This helps to a measure, but again it is without discrimination. And the moment we take too powerful an attitude toward the solution of a problem, this attitude uh, becomes non-instructive as far as our own experiences have meaning for us. Thus it is not good to build high walls around the incidents of living. We cannot afford to arm ourselves against a difficult relative or something of that nature. We may develop enough willpower to tolerate that person while they are with us and go through a social afternoon without a nervous breakdown. But this doesn't answer the real issue. For whatever attitudes we do hold must be sufficiently real or sufficiently valid so that we can hold them without unreasonable effort or the creation of defensive tension in ourselves. In an emergency, we can arise to almost any condition. We have a wonderful ability to meet big problems with innate courage and a reasonable amount of adrenaline. If, however, we try to take a big and courageous attitude toward the entire pageantry of living, both our courage and our adrenaline run out. We have to approach all long-range situations with internal relaxation. We have to find answers that do not demand a forcing of attitudes. We cannot be constantly alert to what we are going to say or what we are going to do. We cannot become guardians of conduct. We have to develop a way in which when we are not trying to be poised, we are still poised. And when we are not trying to be patient, we are still patient. This means we have to develop resources within our own natures. Resources that are stronger than the pressures that may arise around us. If we can build such pressures, uh, we can also build such relaxations. The very energies that are used 
uh, offensively or even defensively are available to us for the simple problem of solution. And in every life, we are still confronted with any situation that we cannot accept graciously. As long as this ability to be gracious is deficient, the problem will remain. Nature wants us to solve things, not to obscure them by further pressure. Nature does not want us to live by a double standard, for example, a standard of constant irritation and difficulty on the inside and an assumed placid exterior, which is not real, that does not actually uh, mean that we have attained any of the purposes or objectives which are proper for us. We can take this directly into the problem of religion. And to most people, many of these issues become moral or religious issues. We may believe in our religious dispensation, our religious doctrine, and we affirm frequently that the peacemaker is blessed. Yet we are not able actually to transform this concept into a vital strength. We keep the peace because we exert certain lawful pressure upon ourselves. Just as the citizens of a community have a certain record for honesty due to the efficiency of the police force, so we can police ourselves. But policing ourselves no more solves our problem than does an active police force actually solve the problem of crime. We have all over the world now well-trained police, but the crime rate is increasing. It is increasing because the individual does not himself uh, attain a state of law-abiding consciousness. So in our problem of the morning, we realize that something has to be done uh, to mature and integrate our consciousness resources. Within ourselves are all the elements and factors required to produce a well-ordered life. We are capable of thinking straight, thinking in a simple and direct way, and thinking in a kindly and constructive way. We do not achieve our ends because actually we make very little effort to regulate our inner lives. We find it more simple, we think, to force a certain outer conformity and in this way keep out of obvious difficulties than to make those changes or growths within ourselves which might solve the problem-making mechanism that we have. This morning, therefore, we want to consider this problem-making mechanism in our own natures. And in order to approach this, we have to recognize, for one thing, the rapid motion of our times. We are not living in a static world. We're living in a very dynamic one. One of the great problems we face today is that the individual cannot adjust to the motion of his time. He cannot uh, grow as rapidly, so far as he can sense growth, as his problems can increase. Thus he is constantly at his wit's end. He is in a state of more or less continuous extremity, when actually he is equipped so that this is not necessary. One of the reasons why we uh, have this problem is that somewhere along the way of life, we stop growing. That is, we cease uh, to continue a dynamic relationship with life. The child growing up reaches a time in which physical growth ceases, and psychological growth begins. Later, he reaches a time in which psychological growth is presumed to reach its maturity, 
and the individual is assumed to be capable of maintaining himself throughout life. Very often, however, uh, the individual stops growing mentally or emotionally uh, somewhere along the psychological gamut. He no longer is able to continue this problem of progressiveness within his own nature. Many individuals and many clinics and groups have attempted to figure out what stops man, why he suddenly reaches a point where he cannot change any longer, and settles down to a certain kind of chronic psychological arthritis. Why he does this, I think, can be explained in a number of ways. <clears throat> in the first place, the individual finally reaches that position in life in which he is forced to take on the full, full impact of living itself. As a man, he must go out and maintain a family. He must work, find employment, and adjust himself to the economic pressures of his day. As a woman, she must also assume the responsibilities of maturity, must assume her part in the life of her family and her community. Thus, we may say there is a time when the person suddenly faces a large group of responsibilities. Today, we face these responsibilities very ill-equipped Ill to meet them. Through childhood, we have been protected from responsibility. Then something happens, a wand is waved, a 21st birthday is celebrated, and we are suddenly believed to be grown up. From that moment on, pressures begin to pile in on us. People are no longer as patient with us. We can no longer run to the security of parental counsel. We no longer have our thinking done for us. And uh, while we think of all of this as a liberty greatly to be desired, when we face it, we are not always up to the challenges which come. So in the course of from five to ten years after the attainment of physical or psychological maturity, we come to the period of disillusionment. Disillusionment is the sudden discovery that the world does not belong to us. It is the sudden realization that we're not going to be able to live exactly as we please for the rest of our mortal span. We also discover that in the world of competitive situations, our own abilities may not be as complete or adequate as we thought. We had dreamed of achieving great heights, and after five or ten years of struggling for these heights, we may decide that the battle is not worth the prize. At least we discover that we're not going to achieve all the things that we had hoped for. We are going to discover that business is not an endless cycle of promotions. We are going to discover that a home is not a continuing paradise on earth. These discoveries, for some reason, we are not equipped to handle. We have developed certain abilities and initiatives, but something is missing. And in the life of Western man, this something really consists of two uh, very vital factors. One is that Western man has no essential tradition upon which to lean. Most cultures and civilizations have pride of nation, uh, pride of background. They look out upon a world uh, which has been strong and steady for centuries. They look around them to find community lives in which other people are living in a rather simple, direct, orderly way. The example around us can be of great help in assisting us to adjust. These examples will moderate our unreasonable ambitions and will help us uh, to settle down into a kind of life that is enough, that is suitable to our requirements, but not necessarily spectacular. 
I always remember the example of trying to buy a car in Gibraltar. You couldn't buy the car at that time because the car dealer was closed. The reason he was closed was because he had sold a car. Having sold a car, he had no interest in selling another one until he had spent the money. So he gathered up his family and they all went on a vacation. Uh, this individual would never be burdened with most of the pressures that we suffer from. He would not have economic ulcers because economics did not mean that much to him. He had worked out a problem and had discovered a pattern which enabled him to live comfortably and pleasantly, but he was never going to break any sales records. He was never going to be the largest car dealer in the country. Of course, perhaps he had a little help. There were not many in Gibraltar. But in any event, his ambitions were patterned upon certain traditional patterns. One of the reasons he had this kind of ambition is because his neighbors had it. He didn't have to compete with that hard, biting, shrewd businessman who already had two swimming pools. He wasn't worried about these things. The neighbors around him were living as he lived. When they had a few dollars, they enjoyed life as he did. There was no terrible pressure pattern. Uh, the traditional background was one in which business was maintained and conducted for the purpose of providing the individual with as much leisure, comfort, and pleasure as possible. That was the way uh, the whole theory was set up. Because it was set up that way, he had the proper social standing by complying with the pattern rather than by violating it. He had his self-respect, he was uh, recognized, a good solid citizen. Uh, everything that he really wanted in the form of status he had without tension. This is one situation that, that conspires with us to keep us in a continuous uproar. The fact that to us all business progress is the excuse for greater progress. Little by little we have lost sight of what most foreign nations are still striving to hold on to, even under the pressure of our way of life, and that is that we work in order that we can have time to live. We have never confused the two issues. So tradition, where this type of tradition exists, is a great support to us in moderating our attitudes and protecting ourselves. The second factor that is very important throughout life is early discipline. In the last 50 years, this has broken down dangerously here in this country. The child is no longer taught the importance of regulating its own attitudes. It is no longer given the power and the ability to make decision or to adjust to the decisions of others graciously. When the child, uh, as in the case of the American home, becomes an escape mechanism for the parental attitudes, uh, the child is deprived of most of the strength necessary for its own life. I was talking to someone the other day who simply could not get into their minds or couldn't understand why uh, it wasn't a virtue to make life easy for their children. Uh, this person had grown up in limited means and had finally attained considerable freedom. The person was fairly strong himself. He had a pretty uh, decent character, and he did not realize it, but the reason for his strength was struggle. He was now engaged in trying to protect his children from the very struggle that had made him a man. He was trying to save them hard knocks. He was bringing them up in the attitude that anything they wanted they should have. This attitude is, of course, on the level of perpetual adolescence. And the children, not having been disciplined, not having ever helped around the family, having no regular assignments of duties or responsibilities. 
escaped more and more into their own activities until if for some reason any discipline was imposed upon them, they were rebellious and hurt. When this individual, uh, the child, grows up and goes into the world only to react in the same way, that to do anything we do not want to do is impossible, uh, that there, there is no reason why we should not have anything we can get our hands on, that other people who have more are simply criminals. As we uh, gradually develop this kind of attitude, uh, we are all set to suffer, because life isn't going to operate this way. There is no one in a worse situation than a spoiled child starting out on the path of maturity. One of the reasons why uh, we still depend heavily upon the older generation in times of emergency is because the older generation was disciplined and has brought into maturity and even into older years a degree of courage that we do not have, a degree of resourcefulness that we have never trained, and a series of strong convictions about right and wrong, which can be of the greatest value if they are not overdone. Thus we have come into our present uh, generation uh, with a good many weaknesses within our own natures, weaknesses that we have not been taught to correct, uh, which have permitted us to take very negative attitude toward life. The spoiled child will hate a parent who suddenly becomes strict. A spoiled adult will hate a world which does not conform to his expectations and find in him all the virtues that he believes he has. And out of this spoilage system, for that is what it actually amounts to, we will also have generations of unadjusted persons who will form themselves into uh, various groups of unpleasant political nature, uh, dangerous uh, attitudes, who will not uh, want to face any limitation of means or earning power, to whom life must be a continual unfoldment of extravagance. Uh, these kind of folks simply help to make a world unhappy. Where enough of them develop and they become definitely antisocial, a country under such conditions may fall into a dangerous sociological pattern. And many individuals who really belong in this group have led their countries into communism or something of that nature and lost all their rights and all their privileges as the result. Uh, this condition can occur anywhere if the individuals making up a society are not to a measure adequately self-disciplined. We can therefore say for the, in the most cases, that the overwhelming majority of our people have not the power to adequately discipline themselves. They do not realize the importance of creating personal character. They do not realize that most of their troubles are simply due to the fact that they have no clear internal concept of right conduct. And even if they think they have the concept, they simply lack the willpower to apply this concept in daily living. Now, a concept held internally uh, cannot be allowed to simply crystallize into uh, a complete fixation. A concept is a working background. Uh, one of our educators not long ago pointed out the tragedy of an educational concept in which the individual learned what could be taught, but did not learn how to think. This process of accumulating knowledge, but having no skill within ourselves in the use of knowledge, or in the adaption of knowledge to our own needs, where this skill is lacking, the person is in serious trouble. It is exactly the same problem as the individual who studies music. 
he may take piano lessons for years. Today, the first thing the young music student wants to do is to learn to play his favorite melody. Therefore, nearly all modern music instruction, instrumental and vocal, is poor. It is poor because the only end is that the individual shall be able to play his favorite tune within three lessons. This will now allow him to amaze others who have not yet taken three lessons, but will also bring upon him some rather negative thoughts from a good musician who maybe has been studying for 20 years. Now, the danger of the three-lesson musician is very obvious. He may have to go through life playing only one melody, the one he has learned. <laughs> Perhaps in time he can learn another one. And if he lives long enough, he may be able to develop a repertoire of a dozen pieces. But he has no basic knowledge of music. He cannot sit down before the instrument, take a a sheet of good music and play it because he knows all of the technical steps that are necessary. Therefore, he is not able to adapt his musical knowledge so that he can really be a musician. He really hardly wants to be a musician, perhaps. But here we have the same principle involved as we have in education. We can educate the individual so that he can play some one tune so that perhaps he can get a job playing that tune. And for the rest of his life, he will be able to do this one thing he has learned to do. Outside of this area, his knowledge is totally inadequate. If, however, he had been patient in the first place and learned the principles of music, if he had been willing to acknowledge that a good career in music requires these weeks and months of playing scales. Whereas in one case I know of, the student was very miserable because it was five years before he was permitted to play a piece of music through. But when he was able to play, he was a good, well-trained musician. Now, in order to take these long, difficult courses of self-improvement, the person has to be disciplined. The child resents the discipline of the parent who wants him to take music lessons. He may escape from it as soon as possible. But if he escapes, he will be unable to do what a good musician can do. He may not feel that he needs it, but certainly he cannot have it unless he is willing to discipline himself and receive it. Much more complicated and important is this problem of laying the basic foundations for a total life. If it takes several years to learn to play a piano with a reasonable degree of efficiency, we are not going to learn to live without dedication of effort, without continuity of effort, without permitting or allowing the uh, disciplining of our attitudes to interfere with other activities or pleasures or good times that we might want to enjoy. Dropping out of school is another testimony to this same situation. It tells on one side that the educational program is not adequate, and it points out on the other side that the young person hasn't strength enough to even finish high school. That is, strength of will, strength of purpose. It does not occur to him that he should do things that at the moment are bothersome, monotonous, or uh, lack glamour in one way or another. So everywhere along the way, as we reach maturity, we have to face one definite problem. Are we able to lead and direct our lives? Are we able to make decisions that are necessary and keep them? Are we willing to make the necessary sacrifices of some things in order to attain other things? Are we really constantly concerned with growing, or are we consistently avoiding growth because it is troublesome, a responsibility, and an interference with pleasure? The person reaching 
maturity has to make decisions of this nature. Now, it is possible that he did receive some conditioning in his childhood home, that he was taught certain degrees of manners, even if he did not uh, fully accept the family leadership. He may have some strengths that he has attained, but perhaps they are not adequate uh, for the needs that he has at the present moment. In any event, he is likely to build a kind of uh, eclectic philosophy of his own. Having reached majority without a strong leadership in religion, or ethics, or morality, or culture, or even in education, although he may be well educated, the person does not have in any of these enough strength to lean on in time of decision. They are all weak factors, present but not dynamic in his affairs and in his character. So out of a series of disappointments, disillusionments, discouragements, antagonisms, worries, fears, and doubts, he gradually fashions an eclectic philosophy of life, which moves in on him perhaps when he is in his thirties or early forties. This is a philosophy of defeatism in the majority of instances. It is a philosophy of avoidances, a pattern of compromises in which the person uh, tries to decide the easiest way out of impossible conditions. There, there is again no real leadership. There is a negative adjustment to inevitables following discouragement. Once this pattern has been set up out of trial and error, mostly error, and out of uh, the negative results of an uncontrolled nature trying to function in a highly competitive society, out of all of this and many contributing factors of personal disappointments and things of that nature, will come usually uh, not a good, solid integration, but stubbornness, willfulness, uh, a, some kind of a negative, dogative conditioning in which the individual just keeps on going because it's all he can do. Or perhaps a gradual dissolution of character and the person falling to the point where he can't take care of himself or anything else. This is the basis of too many philosophies of life. Not having uh, established themselves well, these individuals finally develop a series of attitudes by which they intend to live for the rest of their lives. The attitudes were no good when they were first developed, and they do not improve with age. They will not solve anything because there is no solution in them. They were not accumulated as the result of purposed and uh, in, intelligent reaction. They were simply the individual accepting negative experiences as the basis of a future code of conduct. One man will say, I've been cheated on every hand. Now I'm going to do a little cheating of my own. And that becomes his philosophy of life. It is not possible for anyone to build anything worthwhile upon such a foundation. Once, however, these attitudes set in, uh, they begin to color our futures. Just as discipline would brighten the future, so these negative attitudes begin to darken it. The worse our own attitudes, the more our difficulties will increase in number and intensity. We cling to our attitudes. We do not learn from our disappointments that we are wrong. Therefore, the things that happen to us become further evidence that we were right in assuming that nothing good could happen. It becomes a vicious circle. And out of this vicious circle, life after life uh, reaches uh, disillusionment, discouragement, and despair. So once we get to the point of maturity and have a mind that is set in a certain kind of rut, a certain kind of negation, 
uh, we have to either prepare for the worst or else do something to change this basic attitude. Now, we cannot change it in three easy lessons. We cannot change it even by prayerfulness. We cannot concentrate ourselves out of it by ten lessons in yoga. We cannot achieve release through a couple of books on Zen. These things could help, but they will not help unless we are willing to give to these remedies their proper opportunities to develop within ourselves. Again, in searching for solution, we must use this discrimination and determination and discipline that we have not used up to that time in any constructive way. People come all the time, and their answer is usually the same thing. Yes, I know. It, that would be the thing to do, all right. Oh, that would be splendid. But I just can't do it, you know. Well, why can't you? Well, I don't know why, but I can't. Well, why? Can't you find out some reason why this weakness in you cannot be remedied? And someone will actually say, well, I guess the reason I can't do it is because I really don't feel like doing it. Or another one will come out perhaps a little more honestly and admit, frankly, they have not the strength of character to do it. These are all evasions because they are not true. Anyone who has enough strength to get into trouble also has enough strength to get out of it. <laughs> there is no reason why we should have plenty of energies with which to maintain misery and none with which to recover from misery. So we are all faced somewhere along the line with a decision. If our childhoods were not properly disciplined, then it is our job to take over the work and accomplish it. Out of every situation that arises comes the challenge to integrate our own resources. We either have to do this or continue to drift in the problems that seem troublesome and, and dangerous to us. Now, how are we going to develop this kind of strength? Well, nature bestows it. It isn't something we have to manufacture out of thin air. Discipline for the average person is not nearly as arduous as he thinks it is, because mind has created around the term discipline a most unhappy and unhealthy semantic overtone. To the average person, uh, discipline is always doing what he does not want to do. It is always interfering with the things that he does want to do. As long as this attitude remains, it is a very massive effort to try to achieve anything of a constructive nature. We haven't realized yet that discipline is natural, that it is the simple, easy thing to do. The discipline is only difficult because we have mentally determined that it shall be. Discipline is only impossible to us because we have never assumed that our own natures have a meaning or a purpose or a reality. It, we, we just do not, uh, we do not think straight on this particular issue. And in this case, straight thinking is very simple and natural thinking. If we are capable of simply getting rid of some of the false layers of attitude that we have, discipline becomes a very simple and a natural problem. I have some relatives who are very fond of skiing. It's one of their great joys in life. Now, because it is a great joy in life, they break a leg or a rib every year and enjoy it tremendously. They even have medals they award to each other. And uh, you will come and meet one of your old friends, find him in a cast in a wheelchair somewhere with a brand new medal, and he is sublimely happy. He missed the ski slope a little bit. He has a compound fracture, and it's very near what he had the year before. But this isn't work. This isn't discipline. 
the fact that he goes every morning at dawn up that mountain and comes on down and hopes that he can get both of his skis on one side of the tree on the way down. <laughs> this isn't hard work. This is sheer joy. When he does break an arm or a leg, all his friends come in. He is a person of importance. As one said, he had a few hours of pain, but years of satisfaction. <laughs> now, to the non-skier, this is a mystery that will never be solved. <laughs> Some people will never appreciate getting up at four o'clock on a cold morning and going up a ski lift, taking a long time to get up and a few minutes to get down and go up again, and do this hour after hour, and really have one grand time. Yet this person, in order to do this with some success, as the man I know, has studied skiing for nearly 20 years. It took him the first 10 years to have a really good accident. That is one that was worthy of conversation later. <laughs> He thought nothing of spending thousands of dollars and thousands of hours to learning to slide down this mountain in one piece. <laughs> it costs him two or three hundred dollars every time he buys a new pair of skis. He has to have the whole outfit, of course. He belongs to all kinds of groups and associations and carries heavy insurance on his hobby. <laughs> If anyone was compelled to do that, they'd leave home. <laughs> they would consider themselves the most miserable, underprivileged, dominated individual. If any government insisted that we do it, we would overthrow that government in two hours. <laughs> and yet to this man, if you tell him it's hard work, he looks at you as though you did not know what you were talking about. It is joy because it is what he wants to do. Now, discipline of all kinds is just exactly the same thing. The golfer either has to learn to play golf well, take lessons from a professional, and spend half of his free time out on a golf course, or he will never be the local champion. And the local championship is worth it to him. He goes on and he does these things. So that discipline is possible to every human being. The only thing is he must want it. To him, discipline must be more meaningful than the lack of it. If he can recognize the real facts involved, he will realize that along the way of life, he has attained certain kinds of discipline. He has learned not to be late to work. He has learned there were things that had to be done in order to maintain his patterns of living, and these things he does. And he seldom regards these achievements as a great attainment. They are the least of two evils, so that is the one he practices. Thus, discipline is always possible, but only to the person who basically wants it. If life is more important to us than sliding down an icy mountain at dawn, we will take the discipline to make life valuable. Now, there's one thing that a good skier is always concerned about, and that is new equipment, new ideas, and new techniques. The skier does not learn to ski when he is 14 and change in no way after that until he dies. It's a poor year when he doesn't find some new equipment. It is another poor year in which he does not learn some other way of improving his skill. So discipline in every area is continuous. It is a constant reaction to the challenge of the art, science, or sport with which he is involved. There is no way to stop. The moment you stop, uh, you lose your p place in the vanguard of things. And it is the same in the disciplines of living. 
the individual who disciplined himself 20 years ago and thought that was enough is in trouble today. Discipline is a continuous adjustment to the challenge of situations, but it is an adjustment in which the person is always leading, is always making his own decisions, and is always weighing and measuring the various probable consequences of the decisions that he does make. So we can say that this problem of discipline is that we will accomplish whatever the heart and mind resolve to accomplish. The philosophy teaches us that the greatest of all discipline, the greatest of all joy to man, comes in the quiet, orderly regulation of his own life. Now, if the skier is reasonably successful, he may have only a few broken bones, and uh, a number of uh, the skier's equivalent of the Purple Heart to testify to his achievement. But if his interests lie beyond this into the greater world of things, uh, the person practicing disciplines that are adequate has a number of rewards that are more important than a little status among his associates. The quiet, thoughtful individual realizes that discipline imposed by himself upon himself <coughs> will pay off in terms of efficiency, adjustment, comfort, happiness, safety, improvement of health, the probable escape of many from many chronic infirmities that affect affect those who do not discipline their lives, and that in the terms of the larger purposes of universal law, s discipline is what turns out the adequate person, the person who is able to face the life he lives with inner peace and outer courage. If this is true, it would seem that it is more important than learning to ski, or to bowl, or to play golf. It is really more important to that person than a great material success, uh, because this material success can collapse immediately if the possessor thereof lacks discipline. So discipline becomes our need. And discipline is something that no one else can bestow upon us, really. We can get a certain amount of discipline if we go in the army. The state will bestow a little bit of us, a bit of discipline, if we insist upon entering penitentiaries. But all in all, discipline is something we have to develop ourselves. We have to develop it by a program and a plan as private citizens. And discipline can never be, and here's where our danger lies, discipline can never be merely the setting up of a goal, a set situation, and then trying to work toward it. Discipline must be the development of this inner capacity to meet challenge wherever it may arise, simply because the total person is capable of meeting a total situation. It would be useless for the skier to practice year after year uh, working his way around one tree. He must be able to guide himself no matter where the tree is. He must be able to judge his distances which will vary with every run that he makes. Wherever he goes, the situations are different. Wherever the golfer goes, the hazards are in a different place. But if he knows what he is doing, he meets them all. Thus, he cannot have a set pattern, uh, which is only good on his own familiar course. He must gradually develop the ease and ability to adjust to all of the different courses that come. If he can do this, he also keeps himself vital and alive during the whole process of living. Uh, living is very much as though the skier went every day or every week to a different ski course. It is something we have to face with new patterns and new emergencies every day. Thus, it is not the 
pattern that we must solve, but the lack of ability within ourselves to meet diversified challenge. If we get so we can live pretty well in 1940, we cannot stop because we must face 1950. And in 1960, we must face 65 and 70. Thus, our inner discipline must not be tied to particulars, but to the giving to our nature of a general strength. Wherever we get set in our ways, we become addicted to particulars. Wherever we have a pattern that has served us and we try to project it into the future, we endanger ourselves. This is especially true when futures are as uncertain as they are today. So we are not looking for answers to problems. We can never solve them all. We are looking to the power within ourselves, which is a universal problem-solving power. It is the power in ourselves, and not the patent answer, that we must seek. The young medical student, uh, going through his course of procedure, studies the human body from charts and diagrams, and finally in the laboratory, by dissection. And yet he learns to know along the way that when he goes into the field of the practice of medicine or surgery, he cannot depend upon those charts. He will not find things just as they should be or as he expected them to be. He must always have a resourcefulness. He must have built a general insight which will enable him to face an emergency of difference with a cool mind and a steady hand. Otherwise, the patient is the loser. So it is always this problem, and this is one of the points that Zen does emphasize, that the purpose of consciousness is not uh, that we can develop patent answers to situations, but rather that we become capable of being at ease in all situations, because we have the power within ourselves which can solve any ordinary emergency that arises. It is this universal solving power for which we must seek and toward which we must direct self-discipline. This means that this discipline of this nature must always deal with principles, with the full recognition that these principles will manifest constantly in different arrangements and patterns. We must come to understand the basic laws governing the universe. We must gradually strengthen that part of our education which has been totally neglected. We have to realize that while in life we may intend to be delicatessens, this is not going to be the only thing that life will challenge us with. We can study the delicatessen business for years and still have a broken home and a miserable family. We have to build on principles. But the principle which will give us the good home will also give us the successful delicatessen business. They are related. They are bound together. Because that which is right and which can be approached with common sense and good judgment will work out. Thus, everywhere along the way, we must work toward principles, toward the building into our consciousness of large patterns of values which can be applied at will to any particular and will not require that the particular conform with any expectancy of our own. If to, if to do this, uh, we have to make a basic study of values. This is not too difficult or too dangerous an undertaking. In Oriental philosophy, one of the principles that is always emphasized and about which we cannot learn too much is the simple fact of cause and effect in life, that everything is dependent upon causation, that causes are constantly producing consequences consistent with themselves, that every act is not only an effect but a new cause, 
that everything that we do start some line of motion with which we must uh, finally adjust ourselves. If, therefore, any action is performed thoughtlessly, selfishly, or ignorantly, the effects of that action cannot be uh, in any way avoided. So that uh, we begin this self-discipline by understanding why it is necessary, why it is valuable, and why it is better for us than the lack of such discipline. We have to sell ourselves this idea. And unless we succeed in selling it to our own minds, we will never get very far. Once we have sold it also, we must do a third job of salesmanship. We must really convince ourselves that we do live in a universe of law and order. Now this means that we have to gradually bring our faculties to bear upon the, con the concept or conviction that we hold. We cannot believe inwardly in the universality of cause and effect and believe that everything that happens to us is unfair. We have to make a decision somewhere. We cannot live by a divided code, and I suspect that so-called split personalities result largely from this difficulty. The individual believing one thing with one part of his mind and something else with the other part of his mind will in the end be two persons, each with a separate group of beliefs. They may inhabit the same body, but they will never work together. Thus we uh, know that the moment a conviction begins to really dig in, it begins to affect the sensory reactions which we have toward life. When we really believe in cause and effect, we will see it operating. There is nothing easier to see than universal integrity. It is everywhere. It is in the function of the smallest fragment of life with which we come in contact. It is exactly the same problem as our ability to recognize universal intelligence. If we believe the universe is without intelligence, we refuse to recognize. If, however, we begin to be aware within ourselves that we do live in an intelligent universe, evidence to support this comes in from every phase of existence. Even the most simple and common daily activities become meaningful when we inwardly accept the fact of meaning. If we insist upon living intellectually in a meaningless existence, the effects of this process will be the misfortunes that we all face. So as the Zen and uh, several other Eastern schools point out, the first thing is to achieve a concept of acceptances. The first acceptance being perhaps the only one that is really necessary for us. But we all have to accept something in as much as universal, absolute truth is not available to us. Therefore, we have to have an acceptance of that which is the best, according to our own insight and the common insight of our species. And this seems to be, in one case, this law of cause and effect. One thing we can also say is that the uh, law of cause and effect reveals its own effects. The one way in which we can judge anything is by its consequences. And that which produces the most consistently fortunate consequences must be regarded as the greatest good that we can know. The law of cause and effect creates right consequences. Therefore, we may have some faith in it. Once we have made this single acceptance, we then call upon every resource of our own consciousness either to prove or disprove this acceptance. And no individual using the resources of his own consciousness has ever been able to disprove cause and effect. On the other hand, all who have intelligently and open-mindedly sought to understand it have gradually become completely converted to its principles. So we say that this is the beginning. This is a large acceptance. 
It can apply in, in detail to immediate problems and to remote problems. It ties values to principles from the beginning, and then we start to explore its possibilities. We become more and more aware that there are rules and regulations. We begin to see how our own suffering is the result of our own action. We begin to see how excesses of habits lead to debilities of health. We see how worry achieves no good and destroys much happiness and security for us. One by one, we estimate the consequences of our own attitudes, and we discover that every poor attitude we have results in poor consequences, that every good attitude that we have gives us some strength, some available insight, some greater skill in the handling of situations. Now, it will may take the person who decides to accept a principle like cause and effect may take him five or ten years in the laboratory of life to make all the tests, to go through all the experimentation uh, that is necessary to transform a belief into a working fact of conduct. He is not going to be able to achieve this a better condition immediately. Even one magnificent wholehearted acceptance won't do it. Even if this acceptance seems to arrive in the form of a vision from the infinite, it won't do it, because it will not overcome the years of negative habits which we have set up within our own mental and emotional lives. As we took a long time to establish them, so we must slowly and resolutely redeem them, reform them, change them, bring them into patterns of usefulness instead of patterns of damage to ourselves. So if we take a principle, keeping it in consciousness constantly, not aggressively in consciousness, something not something we talk about every time we meet someone, but a quiet conviction within ourselves, and we are constantly observant, we shall observe more and more to justify that which we now hold to be a better truth. We shall see how all of the activities of nature take on their lawful appearances and their proper complexions, and we will gradually, in five or ten years, gain the deep abiding sense of reality, we will be certain within ourselves that we do live within a plan that is just, and that this plan, if understood, serves us. This plan, if obeyed, sustains us, and that the only problem in life that is important is, are we keeping faith with this plan? If we are not keeping faith with it, with it, we have no right to expect good. If we are keeping faith with it, we're not in trouble right now. So that the gradual development of this pattern, with its natural disciplines, does not uh, damage our daily living. It does not make us miserable from morning till night. For the discovery of the reason for our own existence is the most dramatic experience that man can ever have. It is the most thrilling of all experiences, the experience of the discovery of realities. Equipped with this gradually unfolding pattern, we gain a certain basic sense of value. This basic sense of value can then be applied to innumerable particulars. The individual who has this basic sense growing in him all the time finds that his difficulties on the outside are becoming fewer. 
he will discover that he doesn't have to fight wrong attitudes. He already knows why they are wrong. And as he knows that they can produce no good for him, he no longer has to defend them so desperately. Little by little, therefore, conviction within himself overcomes the obstacles which the mind sets up. This overcoming is not a deadly struggle between some St. George and his dragon. This, uh, this development of conviction is a quiet way of gradually learning to do what you really want to do, but did not know that you wanted to do it. This conviction is not associated with violent frustrations and inhibitions. And this is where modern psychology must still make its major adjustment. It must realize that instead of curing ailments or treating pressures, that the great work of psychology is establishing principles, principles which the uh, patient can learn to use. For with one principle, he can overcome a thousand particulars. And if he can bring principles to bear upon problems, these principles will always solve. Whereas trying to use some specific remedy that is good only for one problem is ineffective because the moment this problem goes, it reveals another in its place. We cannot solve it this way. The solution lies in having this inner conviction. This inner conviction also requires no external pattern to justify it, sustain it, or protect it. The individual who has this inner part straight is not limited to some pattern for his securities. The family which has built itself around the growth of children may be very seriously demoralized when these children reaching maturity leave home and start their own families. Then the older people are left with no purpose, no value, no vision, no reality. And in many instances, the retiring businessman, having no general pattern of life, uh, is not successful in surviving more than a few years of what might be a very comfortable pension or income. The, he has simply no large adjustment power within himself. Even if he has become used to a situation, even though he has learned to be comfortable in a situation, this is not enough because the situation will change. He must therefore have within himself the power to universally adjust to all changes of situation. Whether these changes bring with the, them, the danger of nuclear warfare, whether these changes mean a major difference in the economic structure of a country, whether these changes involve alteration in social patterns, cultural patterns, educational patterns. The individual who has the straight line of thinking in himself depends upon nothing but himself. Uh, for adjustment. He may enjoy certain situations if they are particularly pleasing to him, but he cannot be destroyed by their departure, nor can he be halted in his growth because an unfortunate situation arises. Thus we say that it is necessary always to prevent the formation of hard solutions. This is one of the things that I have against the present increase of, of pharmacology. We are producing an infinite number of drugs, each of these drugs for a situation. The individual having a certain ache or pain takes one of them. As a result of taking the drug, that pain or ache disappears and another one comes in its place. Uh, we are treating continuously symptoms by various chemical means. Now, we can do the same without drugs by the use of the mind. We can say, as one individual said to me not long ago, well, one thing is certain. I was brought up and taught a certain thing, 
and as long as I live, that thing I'm going to do. Well, if that thing was not good in the first place, it hasn't gotten any better. And the individual is putting his strength upon a particular, not upon a value. It may very well be that everything that this individual was taught will become itself obsolete. Like the child in school that taught a certain line of activity, and this is becoming more prevalent today with automation. Uh, the individual graduating with honors into his profession arrives to find his profession no longer exists or will only last a few years. Thus he has been trained for something, but he has not been trained for change, and everyone has to be. The individual has to be trained also uh, that in the course of keeping his values straight, he may sometimes find it necessary to cause change himself. He must know how to do this. He must do it always lawfully. He must do it always with a full understanding and insight of value, or the change will only become the cause of disaster to him. So we have to always build upon these basic principles keeping the particulars very much in suspension, adjustable to any time and to any place, but always growing and unfolding insight into the great basic principles and concepts of life. As he comes to understand these concepts, they also become the basis of a new morality. They become the basis of his understanding of right and wrong. They help him to escape uh, the confusion that may arise in society where right and wrong are no longer clearly perceptible. The individual gains from these concepts and this understanding every inducement, every invitation uh, to self-improvement and self-orientation. If he is not willing to accept the invitation, that is up to him. But it is not to be said that nature has denied it to him. It is not to be said that he has lived in a world in which he never could be right. It is not to be said that circumstances destroyed him. He was simply hurt and perhaps seriously injured because he was never able to understand the meaning of circumstances and how these arise from basic patterns which all living creatures must understand and follow. So we want to think in terms of uh, the individual who is gradually strengthening basic patterns. Now some folks don't think they need to strengthen basic patterns. We have in this world a few rather egocentric souls that firmly believe they are always right. <laughs> Now, this can be a very serious and dangerous situation also. And this belief that we are always right, uh, it takes a lot of energy to maintain because we must always act defensively. Also, we must argue our heads off in order to try to convince other people that we are right when everyone concerned knows that we are not. This is not uh, useful, valuable, or purposeful. The answer to every question, are we right, is the, the answer that is inevitable. Are we living, adjusted, constructive, reasonably happy lives? The individual who is always right and always miserable must face the fact that he is not right. Because misery comes not of itself, but comes from infringement upon the principles of natural law. The individual cannot be doing the right thing if the wrong thing happens to him. So he has to settle down also, and sometimes renounce a certain amount of worldly egoism. He must perhaps be a little more humble, and nearly all religions and philosophies advocate a reasonable humility. There are two things that bring persons gradually into an understanding of law. One is necessity, the pressure of circumstances, and the other is humility, the recognition of internal ignorance. 
The individual who doesn't know and realizes this is in the best possible condition to learn. So we have to have a certain natural humbleness. We cannot be constantly defending our mistakes and at the same time correct them. We have to gradually recognize the mistake. The best way to recognize it, of course, is always to start the building up of principles. Because if our concepts of principles enrich, our mistakes will become obvious to us. When that happens, we have to have the grace and the humility and the kindness, the gentleness, to accept the fact that we were wrong and to try to make the necessary changes. Thus we realize that in some way that we're not quite able to understand, man has survived. He has survived from the most remote times. He has survived an innumerable disasters, both natural and artificial. He came out of some prehistoric world with very little equipment, very little way to compete even successfully with the vast animal world around him. Man has gone on and on through all the ages, building civilization after civilization. How long he has been here as man, we are not too sure. Science is now beginning to think in terms of millions of years. But whatever final decision we make, we know that he has had a long and troubled journey but that he has survived. And the reason why he has survived is that, su that survival is innate. Survival did not depend upon plumbing, although plumbing helped survival. <laughs> survival did not depend upon the invention of fire, but this helped it in some way or other. Survival did not depend upon building a house with a roof, but survival was advanced by the fact that we did these things. Numerous creatures around us in nature have survived with none of these things. But our way was to create with our minds means of advancing or preserving the probabilities of our survival. We have survived our own mistakes, the wars that we have fashioned, the plagues and pestilences due to our own superstitions and stubbornness. We have come down through a great period of time because there was within ourselves this tremendously vital, adjustable spirit of life. We have adapted to a thousand climates and a hundred governments. We have done all kinds of things that were necessary, because in us there is this instinct uh, to go on. Gradually we discovered we had other instincts. And one of these other instincts that we discovered was this constantly increasing desire to know. We wanted to understand more. We wanted not merely to live like other animals, uh, roaming the forests, we, or simply living off of the benefits of the seasons. We wanted to know why. We wanted to understand the universe, its creating power, and our own place in it. And almost from the beginning, men worshipped something. They reached out toward the unknown, seeking always to discover the benevolent source of life. Out of thousands of years of philosophy and religion, we have now integrated a reasonable concept concerning the nature of the universe in which we live. We have not solved all of its mysteries, but we have come to have some fraternity of understanding with the universe. We begin to recognize its immensities, its tremendous benevolences. We begin to realize also more correctly our own relationship with it, that we are part of it, that we are under its rules and that we are governed by its laws and that man-made laws to be successful must be patterned after these universal laws and not be in conflict with them. And out of all of this also we have recognized that nature has set up a code of conduct for man. This code is something that has to be obeyed. We cannot change it. We can only change our own adjustment to it. 
This code restricts nothing that is desirable for us. This code does not prevent us from growing. It makes growth possible. It does not prevent us from unfolding un intelligence or emotion or action. It makes all of these unfoldments reasonable and purposeful. Nature is not sitting like some frustrating autocrat upon us. Nature is constantly the teacher, the wise friend, the benevolent elder, always seeking to bring us into realization of the good which is essential to our happiness. Thus, if we are interested at all in having good lives, if we want to solve problems, we must finally understand nature, not only intellectually but intuitively. We must sense nature not only as law but as beauty, as truth, as love, as friendship, as everything that is suitable for the fullest expression of the best part of ourselves. And then we have a simple adjustment to make, and that is the acceptance of that which we can never resist. To make a gracious adjustment to something we are going to have to adjust to anyway. We have no choice. We have only the, the uh, timing of the situation. We can delay this adjustment longer. We can make it sooner. But make it, we must. Thus, we have really no frustration involved. We have no problem. We have only the need to bring our own attitudes and our own conduct and our own thinking into harmony with the plan which created these things. All the faculties that we possess come from something, come from somewhere, and are given to us for some good reason. All we have to do is use them properly, fulfill them, uh, help them to grow as we would make flowers more beautiful in a garden. And we will be rewarded as the gardener is with a beautiful uh, group of flowers, a beautiful garden suitable to our continuous enjoyment. Therefore, from principles, we get working instruments which are timeless. There is no need for stubbornness. There is no need for reaction. There is no need to believe that we must be anything because we have been that. There is freedom from all of these restrictions, and life can quiet down uh, to the person moving from within himself into action on the level of the best that he knows, the best that he can come to know, a best that is growing better every day, because the best is constantly accumulating more good to itself by its very nature. The good life is the life that is uh, new in learning every day. The good life is constantly experiencing more goodness, and out of this developing more ways of reacting constructively to the pressures of situations. So we have to have an open and flexible life. And against that flexible life and that openness, there is just this very thin wall of mental fixation, uh, of, of mental restriction, of habit restriction, which we have placed upon ourselves. Between us and becoming one uh, with this new thing is what Bimi, the German mystic, called the old Adam. Now, uh, in each of us, according to Bami, there was not only uh, the celestial power, but what to he termed the old Adam, or the man of earth, earthy. Now, for most of us, the old Adam is about the only chap we recognize. The old Adam is the individual we've been living with since birth. A rather crotchety character for the most part. Selfish often, self-centered usually, irritated most of the time, and discontented always. This old Adam is the thing we have always been, the way we have always done things, and the attitude we expect other people to accept from us, and our way of accepting everybody else's attitudes toward us. 
It is just a crotchety a personality uh, that uh, we have accumulated by the general neglect of value. Nothing has been done about it. It's just been allowed to grow like topsy. And like things that grow without discipline, it has turned to weed. This old Adam is the chap we're trying to live with now. And he is a thorn in the flesh and always has been. But we do not have to continue with him. For as Bamey points out, there is a new Adam, the new self in us, the Adam which carries within it the redeeming power of grace. There is this greater self, the man of heaven, who is constantly present, overshadowing the man of earth. So what we have to do is to gradually leave behind the restrictions of this old Adam. We do not cast him off. We do not drop him somewhere as something no longer valuable like an old suit of clothes. Actually, we build this old Adam into the new, for we are redeeming him ourselves. He contains within himself all of the practical means of accomplishment, the body, the thoughts, the emotions. We need these instruments, but we have to give them inner light. We have to dedicate them to values. We have to give them new reasons for their own existence from some depth of insight in our own souls. So we are seeking to redeem this self that we have known too long and which we really have very little use for as far as deep conviction is concerned. It is this old Adam that is argumentative, selfish, critical, condemnatory. It is this old Adam that worries, fears, and frets. It is this old Adam that is hypersensitive to everything that arises, is quick to hurt others, and reluctant to be hurt itself. It has excuses for every mistake it makes and tries to make virtues out of all its vices. This old Adam is intolerable. We all have had enough of him. We've all fought with him for years. So we might as well change the general attitude toward him, change the whole situation, realizing that he is only a little tyrant because the real self in us has never taken over, has never asserted its own powers, that we have never lived from any internal pattern that was strong enough to educate this little Adam correctly. So that this earthly Adam is like a child in our own bodies. It is a small person growing up, needing discipline, needing direction, needing insight, needing counsel, and instead of that being allowed to run wild and destroy us. If we begin to see this quietly and thoroughly, we will realize how unfair, unreasonable, and even ridiculous the situation is and gradually our own insight will take over. If it begins to take over, it will grow, it will educate this little Adam the way it should be, and finally we will find, instead of a tyrant, a good and faithful friend, one dedicated as we are dedicated to obedience to those principles which are immutable. Thus, uh, we, we can face these issues we can improve them. We are not fighting walls or barriers. We do not have to arrive at a certain attitude. We do not have to have a code written down on paper. We do not have to say, this I will stick to to the bitter end, no matter what happens. We are not dependent upon formal things of this nature for our leadership. We are not dependent upon codes written upon rock by man. We are dependent upon laws traced in the universe by the hand of God. These great laws, once we understand them, take care of all the little things. And it is actually true in conduct that if we will seek first the kingdom of God in its righteousness, all other things shall be added unto us. If we once make this inner adjustment with principle, 
the, dis the disposition falls into the correct pattern. There is no longer any struggle, any fight, any warfare. The only problem is to seek first the basic values, then let the values lead you. To do this is to uh, not be fought, fighting every day with the problems of change, not sighing over every generation that arises, not feeling that we have lived beyond the time in which we could adjust with conditions, not being frightened to death in those closing years which should be peaceful. Rather than all these dilemmas, the recognition uh, that we have, as part of our natural endowment, timelessness, that all times are suitable for the expression of the law. All times, all ages, and all conditions contribute to growth, insight, knowledge, and understanding. And all times lived well by the individual are useful, necessary, and important times for him. Getting the right attitude under this situation and really trying to do something about it will lift most people out of the despondencies and difficulties which uncertainties have given. Let us then really think seriously of seeking first these laws and realizing that when we find them, accept them, and experience them, they will then confer upon us all the good things that we need for our happiness and security in this world. Well, thank you very much, folks. Our time is up. No, we have questions that are asked occasionally. We had a good one not too long ago, which I think might be very interesting. It was somewhat, say, suppositional question, shall we say, but it is one of those strange suppositions that has a tendency sometime to become a fact. How is this going, world going to look to us when we leave it? If we carry consciousness out of this plane of existence into something else, are we going to forget we were ever here? That doesn't seem very practical. It would be helpful, but it sounds impractical. <laughs> if we are going to go on to something else, are we going to be able to look back and watch our descendants squander the resources that we have so carefully accumulated? <laughs> are we going to observe the bitter consequences of our advice to other people when they have carried it out? <laughs> are we going to have a new standard of values? What about the things we thought were important here? Uh, are they going to mean anything? Are we going to le lean over some distant cloud and watch the 1964 election with due attention and interest? What are these things going to mean? If they have no meaning, then, what meaning have they now? Because after all, we are all headed for then. <laughs> and uh, we're making an awful lot of these things now. Are we wasting time? In other words, how is it going to look from out yonder? <laughs> and this might be a very intriguing and worthwhile thought. I'd like to point out that in our gift shop that we have just received a number of very beautiful uh, note cards, some that I don't think are obtainable elsewhere in the community, and we hope that you will visit the gift shop and take a look. As you know, the displays in our library, library are creating considerable attention. Uh, radio stations are carrying announcements of them. The daily press is carrying stories and reports about them. And I think in, f in all kindness to these various media, we should point out that these services are rendered to us without charge. They are part of a community service program, and more and more we are recognized as contributing to community service. So we are very happy to say that the new exhibits in the library have been extremely well attended, especially the present one on Sumi painting, and we are amazed to discover there must be hundreds of uh, uh, growing Sumi artists in the community. And many schools and colleges are carrying courses on these subjects, and groups that we have never previously contacted have come in to see the exhibit, so that we hope that you will also make it your effort to be with us and see this exhibit. The exhibit is open 
on Monday through Friday every week, uh, preferably in the afternoon. If you cannot come in except in the morning, however, arrangements can probably be made for you to see it. It is not open normally on Saturday, but it is open on Sunday from 10 o'clock until approximately 2 o'clock. We ask friends who come in on Sunday, however, to try to visit the exhibit early, uh, realizing that it does close at 2 o'clock. The friends who keep it open have family responsibilities at Sunday, and we do not want to keep them uh, all day because they are graciously contributing this service. So if you are planning to see the exhibit on Sunday, uh, please come in in time so that we can close with reasonable promptness about 2 o'clock and let these good people have part of Sunday to themselves. We hope you will enjoy the exhibit. It will be here this week and next week. Then we will have a new exhibit uh, for you uh, after that length of time. I'd like to also call to your attention uh, that our book, Words to the Wise, on the book table may be of help to you this, uh, in connection with the morning talk, and our booklet, Right Thinking. Also, for those who are looking for some of these rules and would like to think about them more thoroughly and continuously, we recommend our recording, My Philosophy of Life, which has proven of considerable value, we are told, to persons looking for ways to straighten out some of their problems. Let me mention to you Dr. Bode's course and classes on Tuesday evening, and also that I will be speaking uh, my regular class subject on Wednesday evening. So, till Tuesday, Wednesday, or next Sunday, we thank you for being with us.